But this week, we continue on with Titus, like I said, in chapter 2, Life in the Body of Christ. And I'm starting off kind of basically looking at a little bit of what we talked about last time, two weeks ago, and just to kind of go over some of the different offices in the church. Because chapter 2 is more focused on the congregation, the members, than it is on the offices. Chapter 1 was one of the offices, but we have... I've kind of got a list here. You had the prophets, okay, which is primarily, and, and like I said last time, all of these offices overlap each other to a certain degree, okay, because the focus is always on Christ. So they're going to overlap, but the primary role of each one is a little bit different. Um, you have the apostles, you may say, which is the, the beginning of the establishment of the New Testament church. And you had, and then you have now with the establishment, you have the pastors. The p pastor literally means shepherd, to lead and to guide. Okay, and this is why you, you've heard me talk about it many times that I am not a pastor. Bobby is a pastor. There is a difference between the two of us in the gifts that God has given us. Okay, Bobby has a much bigger heart than I have. He does. It's just a fact. I mean, there's good, bad, or indifferent. It doesn't really matter. It's just a fact. Okay? My focus is more of a teacher than a pastor. Bobby is, has that big heart, and he really, really has a deep, caring concern. And it doesn't mean I don't, but not to the depths. I really don't. I'm sorry, but there's times when I don't care. <laughs> Thankful we have Bobby here to care. All right? You know, and then you have, you might know, say, the evangelist is one who's more of a traveling teacher. Um, what's that? Yeah, right. That's more of an evangelist. But an evangelist plants seeds. Okay? The local church cultivates the seeds, cultivates the plants. Okay, and then you have an elder. An elder is the one that is primarily responsibility is the spiritual life of the church. And by that I mean being able to discern and understand that what is taught by anyone in the church is the truth of the gospel. Where the gospel truth, the Bible is the foundation of all truth. It's, that's where it's at. Okay. A deacon is more responsible for the physical aspects of the congregation, whether it be the building or the needs of individuals physically. Now, it doesn't mean that they don't have any spiritual role. Yes, they do, because it's all part, all tied together again. And then the overseer, which is really more of a combination of all of the above. But you notice the member I have listed way up the list, because in the Church of Christ, it's always turned around as far as importance of roles. And it is. The pastor, the elder, the deacon are actually further down the list than the members. And, to be, and the members are to be treated that way. But members also have a responsibility, and that's what we're primarily going to focus on this morning in Titus chapter 2. So as we pick up, verses 1 and 2. But as for you, Paul is writing to Titus, and he's, that's who he's re referencing. You is Titus. Teach what is consistent with sound doctrine. Okay, the word doctrine, which is a, here again a church word that we hear all the time, um, actually has a meaning that we seldom really look at specifically. But doctrine literally means teaching. So, be consistent in sound teaching. Consistency means that we're not teaching this one week and then teaching that the next week or following events that are happening in the world and trying to accommodate the world in the midst of teaching the gospel. Right. We're, we're here to hurt your feelings if necessary. Okay, because the truth is the truth. 
Now, it must always be presented in a loving way. It doesn't mean we intentionally go out and, you know, I say, act like idiots and get out there and make all kinds of proclamations. That may be truths, but also discernment and wisdom and how to approach it, but never compromising the truth. This congregation, for a long time, I've, I've been so pleased with what has happened where we have had those that come through the door and they are living a sinful lifestyle, but they've been brought in and welcomed. But not welcomed in the sinful lifestyle. Welcome to be part of this family from a standpoint of understand that what you are doing, the manner in which you are living, is contrary to what God wants for you. We all are. Uh-huh. But we are all welcome. Okay, we're all welcome, but we grow. And if we don't grow, then we become stagnant and die. So growth is also, and this is where that consistency comes in again. So then continuing on, tell the older men to be temperate, serious, prudent, sound in faith, in love and endurance. And that word love we're going to look at in a bit of a detail. Older men, and not necessarily just older in age. Older and more mature in spiritual knowledge. And that's so important. And the word love here is that agape love. Okay, it is the ultimate love. It's the same love that Christ has for his church. The interesting thing about the Greek language, it has a number of words for love. But they're translated love pretty much every time in our Bibles, so we don't really get the depths of the meaning behind each one. And we're going to look at three different ones today. Older men to be serious, prudent, sound in faith. Be serious, not helter-skelter. Be prudent, wisdom. Okay, not just jumping into things. Sound in faith. Sound in faith is knowing what God's Word teaches. We should grow to that point. We should continue on growing to the point to where when we hear something that is contrary to the Word of God, it sets off a bell in our head where we, we recognize that immediately. Or it sets it off to where you know, I never heard that before, and I'm not sure, but I'm going to investigate it. I'm going to check it out for myself. Because like you've heard, Bobby and I both say many times, you don't believe it because we said it. You believe it because the Word of God says it. That is of first and foremost importance. But then it's love. Agape love, it's sort of kind of, a, it's, it's an unconditional love, but its focus is on affection and benevolence. It is a genuine love that has a concern totally for the other and nothing to self. Because there is another love that is totally the opposite in Greek, and we're not even going to look at that one, but this agape love, it's, it's looking after the benefits of others. Verse 3, likewise, tell the older women to be reverent in behavior, not to be slanders or slaves to drink. To be reverent. Older women are to set examples for younger women, just like older men are to set examples for younger men. Not to be slanderers. And also that same word can be translated gossips. And this is just the nature of human beings. We love to beat other people down to refrain from that. And this isn't just for women. This is for everybody else, too. But it purposely separates out teachings that are primarily directed at the differences between men and women, because men and women are not the same. Emotionally, they're not the same. They, they simply are approached differently. And God, being our Creator, understands this. To teach what is good. In other words, there is a certain set of things that are beneficial for the role of a woman to take. They're beneficial for the life of the immediate family and the life of the church. And we're going to look a little bit more than that as, as we get into the next couple of verses. But there is, and this is the reason why in verse 4, so that 
encourage young women to love their husbands. Now you'll find it interesting that love in the agape sense of love, women are never called to love their husbands in that way. This unconditional love. You will never find that in scripture. Because primarily, the difference between men and women is women desire to be loved unconditionally. Men desire to be respected unconditionally. It's our primary makeup. It's the primarily the way that we see things. Men generally will more appreciate respect than love. And women will more appreciate love than respect. It's just our natures. Because God did not create us the same. So encourage young women to love their husbands. And this love is philandros, is the Greek word. Okay? Fond of man. In other words, it is to have an affection towards her husband. An affection that is different than it is to any other man. It is to have a desire and a longing to be with them, to spend time with them, to take part of their lives, their activities, because it's just how you demonstrate this love, this type of love. Okay? It's affectionate as a wife. Now this is failing in so many marriages and it causes so many marriages to fail because that doesn't seem to be there the way it used to be. And maybe, and maybe it's just because I, I, I grew up with that concept that m men treat their wives with the due honor and always put them on a pedestal. And wives would treat their husbands in the same way. That was the norm. And that norm seems to be just totally disappearing because it's like this concept of mixing the roles is the way to go. No, we don't. They are different. The roles are very different. And then because also women are to love their children. And this is a different love again. So now we've gone into the third one. And that one is philokinos. As close as I can pronounce it, okay? Fond of one's children. Now, that maternal instinct, what we talk about, that desire for our children is a different desire than we will have for our husbands or for other people or other people's children. It is a difference again. And this is where God knows us so well that he recognizes this, that he uses these descriptions to demonstrate how well he knows us inside and out and the difference that the world seems to want to try to eradicate you get so caught up into this but then in verse 5 and this is the ones that are totally thrown out of proportion all the time and the church has been guilty of it for a long time to be sensible discreet pure and I put in discreet there because that original word sensible actually is a better translation actually is discreet and this discreetness is wives don't go out and talk to everybody about all the problems that their husbands are that's not wise you don't badmouth your spouse both ways you don't go out into the marketplace and talk about how miserable your spouse is if you have a problem in the family, you keep it in the family, you discuss it, you work it out, and you use the guidance of the Word of God to resolve it. Not to bring it out, oh boy, I tell you, that guy is just as lazy as they come, and I can't, and I, every time he comes home, he just flops down in that lazy boy and flips on the TV, and I don't hear a word from him the rest of the night, and uh, then he starts snoring, and I can't sleep, and I just, you know, all right. well, those will be all true. But that's not the place to deal with it, is in the world. The place to deal with it is in the home between the husband and wife. And because the husband is required by God to love his wife unconditionally, 
as we looked at early on, he needs to sit down and see what he can do to fix the problem. Stop being lazy. Stop flopping down on that love seat and doing nothing. And then the next part, the part that gets thrown out of proportion, good managers of the household. Now, so often the church is taught, well, women, you are to stay in the kitchen. Okay, the husband is to go out and earn the money. But that really presents a conflict in other parts of Scripture. Because you remember a woman named Lydia? Lydia was a businesswoman who was a Christian. She was a seller of purple, and she had a family. So she had her own business, and there are others. No, it doesn't mean that a woman can't work outside the home. But the primary focus, the primary responsibility is in running the household. That means that they are primarily, and not exclusively, but primarily responsible to see to it that there is groceries gotten, whether they go get them or have somebody else does, um, meal planning, um, caring for the children, caring for them in the standpoint of either personally or indirectly, but they're the overseer of the household itself. Just like the man is the overseer of the spiritual household. That's his primary responsibility. He is the one that is to do the praying, do the reading of the scriptures. It doesn't mean that the woman doesn't. It means that that's primarily his focus. We did it. I really tried hard with our when we raised, because we raised three sons. Okay, and Bobby and I have talked about this. He raised four daughters, so it was a totally different approach. Um, but our sons were taught that the, being the man of the house and praying mealtime or whatever else was a privilege that belonged to the man of the house. And they, you were not to just give that up easily. You were not to have your wife start doing the praying because you were giving up a role that was yours, a privilege that was yours. And very seldom did I ever allow any of them to pray at a meal. I would on occasion, just so they would get a little bit of training. But they had to fully understand that this was a privilege that I was not going to give up easily. Now, when they got married and we went to their house, I wouldn't pray. They did. Because they were the man of that house. This was something that had to be taught. And this is something that needs to be taught today probably far more than it did years ago because it seems to be so lacking. Now, it doesn't mean that if the man doesn't do it, the wife shouldn't. No. So often the woman will pick up the slack that the man fails to do and needs to. Yes, in everything. Okay. <laughs> and this is, and then subject to their own husbands. Another thing that gets thrown out of proportion. It doesn't mean that women become slaves. No, it means that they understand the spiritual role of the husband and they honor it. Now, if the spiritual role isn't there and they're not doing their job, then you can't follow it. You can't honor it because God is head. Christ is first. God's law, God's word must be followed without exception from anything else, whether that be in the household or whether that be in government or whatever. God's way is first but the woman should honor and this to me probably falls into a simple like which church are we going to attend where are we going to go okay what version of the bible are we going to read from things that are not primarily salvation issues but things that are the primary role, and the man needs to take this seriously and not just arbitrarily throw things out. He's got to be consistent. We just saw that a little bit ago. Consistency must be there. Must be perfectly there in that role. And there are most of other things, but it's easy to, once you have kind of a concept, it's easy to establish all the different things. To show yourself, and likewise, in verse 6 to 8. Likewise, urge the young men to be sensible, 
show yourself to be an example in purity and doctrine dignified the young men are to learn from the older men these things but the only way that the young men will learn these things is if the older men are living these things if the older men are speaking these things but not living these things the younger men will see that okay all that really matters is what I say it has no bearing on what I do and that is the fault of the older men because if the older men are not living this type of lifestyle they cannot teach it because we teach far more by our actions than by our words older men must be consistent older women must be consistent so that the younger ones learn these things and understand the benefits of these things it's not just that well I gotta do it because God said so no I get to do it because God knows best there's a huge difference this is everything in our lives it's because God knows best follow the manufacturers instructions otherwise you'll be like my truck in the lake but anyway that's another story that we had a few weeks ago verse 9 and 10 urge bond slaves to be subject to their own masters not argumentative not pilfering now this modern day would be employees okay so if you have employees or you are an employee be honoring to your faith be honoring to who Christ is so that people see it so that out there in the world people see and they understand there's something different about you verse 11 and 12 for the grace of God has appeared bringing salvation to all men now this is not saving all men mankind is actually actually the word translated from the Greek is man faced but that seems to kind of throw us off a little bit it's kind of mankind the word of God has appeared to bring salvation to the whole world it's there it's available now there are many who reject it but it's there okay instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires to live sensibly by taking all the things that were spoken of before by putting all these things into play that God has laid out for the different roles of men women church leaders members all these things we end up with instructions that deny ungodliness because if you take and throw any of those away that's ungodliness and worldly desires because there's so much in this world that draws us into it it draw well that let's just move that line a little bit further over because that what I'm doing really isn't that bad but the impact that it has on the next generation is tremendous because whenever we compromise our faith our children our grandchildren see this and they start thinking oh how far can I compromise mine looking for that blessed hope the appearing and glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ this is what we are looking for this is what we are longing for the day when Christ returns that day is coming there is a reality it's not just kind of I hope so I may, may happen but one of these days we will see him returning to get his church and then the sinfulness of this world those all those evil desires all that corruption is gone is done away with because he gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed he purified for himself a people why did he purify himself people why did Christ do what he did because it was because he loved us but he wanted a group of people that desired of their own free will to live for him to serve him to glorify him and they demonstrate this by being zealous for good deeds are we zealous for good deeds 
do we get up looking at what can I do today to bring glory to my God? I failed that myself many times. I look at all the things I have to do with today and all the projects I got to cover and I got all these things in my life. I got to return to that focus of why am I doing all this? Because my God redeemed me. All I can do is respond in acts of gratitude. I can't earn his favor, but I can respond to that love that he's given me, that agape love, that benevolence, that unconditionalness, and I can return as much as I am humanly possible. And, and, and I know I failed, but I can still strive for it because I can be zealous. That is a word that I can obtain to. These things speak and exhort and reprove with all authority. And that is teachers, leaders are to teach these things and based upon the authority of the Word of God. It is to be taught because God's Word says it. Again, not because I said it, but because the Word of God says it. Then, let no one disregard you. If people complain, we stand firm. If people don't like it, we stand firm. Because this is the truth of God. If you disagree with any of it, open up the Word of God. Let's take a look at it. I can be wrong. The Word of God never is. Just remember, consistency, perseverance, and zealous. Please stand and sing, Sanctuary. be true, Lord, that we are living a life that is drawing people into your sanctuary. May we live in a manner that is pleasing to you. May we go from this place better equipped to live for you, to serve you. Bless the rest of this morning, Lord, as we study more, as we learn more, as we praise more. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.